Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another virtual VLA tour. We're really excited to have you today. Uh, we've had about a month and a half break since our last one, and we can't wait to tell you more about our favorite observatory. And today's focus is going to be on partnerships with NASA. Many of you may not know this, and I did not even know before coming to work here, that the VLA has partnered with NASA um, several times over its 40 year history. And we're gonna have some guest speakers today to tell you about some of those really exciting projects. I should introduce myself. My name is Summer Ash, and I am the STEAM Education Manager here at NRAO, uh, based in Socorro, New Mexico with the STEAM Education team that I will ask to just turn on their cameras quickly um, and introduce themselves. Faith, you wanna go ahead? Hey everybody, I'm Faith Vowler. I'm the education specialist and I am also here in Socorro, New Mexico. I've been working at NRAO for a little over four years now. Uh, Tyler. Hi everyone, my name's Tyler. Uh, I am a grad student uh, here uh, as well as a part-time tour guide. And Montana. Hi everyone, I'm Montana. I'm also a grad student here in New Mexico and a part-time tour guide. Yay, we have a great team here. Um, so I'm going to hand the presentation off to Faith to get us started and Tyler and Montana will be active in the Q&A and in the chat. And um, so we hope you enjoy. Take it away, Faith. Thanks, Summer. All right, so here is how um, this is going to work today. Let's just get some quick uh, housekeeping out of the way. So um, this is going to last, well, it says an hour, but today it's gonna to be more like an hour and a half to make sure that we have time to talk about everything that we'd like to today. And uh, down in the bottom of your window, you'll hopefully see a Q&A feature right there. And so that's where you should put any questions that you may have. And so throughout the tour, um, our great EPO staff and our guest speakers are going to be answering some of the questions uh, just through a chat feature. So keep an eye on the Q&A feature to see if your question's been answered. And then others we're going to be uh, saving for a live Q&A feature at the end. And so if you put your question in the chat, it's pretty likely that we won't be able to see it. So please make sure if you have a question you'd like to ask us that you put it in the Q&A and you can use the chat to uh, let us know if we're having any kind of technical difficulties here in New Mexico, our internet isn't always the best. And so if there's some kind of technical issue going on, then the chat is a good place to put that. And it's also a good place to chat with your fellow uh, audience members. So make sure that your chat features are set to, depending on which version of Zoom you have, it might say all panelists or attendees and attendees, or it might just say everyone, but that do that to make sure that everyone else can see your messages as well. And throughout our tour, um, Montana is going to be posting links in the chat with some of the website features that we'll be talking about. But if you don't get a chance to click on it and take a look, we're also going to be sending you an email after today's webinar is done and the links to um, all the same links that we put in the chat throughout today's webinar will also be in that email. So you'll be able to get them there too. And so, like I said, there's the chat and the Q&A. And um, if we don't get the chance to answer your question, or if you think of a question later that you would like to ask us, then um, please, you can go to our Ask an Astronomer feature. And so please feel free to submit it there. We already have an archive of many questions that have been asked in the past. So you're welcome to look through that archive and see if the answer to your question is already posted there. And if it's not, you're welcome to submit your own question. And usually the answers to those questions are posted online within three days, oftentimes sooner. So now, um, and then we're also going to have a couple of guest speakers uh, later on. And so um, Miller and Jason will each get their chance to tell you a little bit more about these partnerships with NASA and so um, and about the work that we've done there. So I'm gonna start off just by talking about the VLA itself and how it works and some of the work that we've done. And then um, later on, we're going to have one of our operators come on as a guest speaker and then Miller and Jason as well. 
And so to start, so who are we? We are the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and um, we're the ones who own and operate the VLA. And NRAO was founded in the 1950s with the goal of building and operating observatories to study radio light that comes to us from space. So radio light is a type of, so typically when you use a backyard telescope, you're looking at visible light, which is the kind that your eyes can see. So radio light is a type of invisible light that we're not able to see with our eyes. So we need um, special telescopes or devices to be able to study them. And that is um, what the telescopes that we build are meant to do. And so NRAO is funded by the National Science Foundation, NSF. So that means that a very small portion of your tax money pays for the VLA and for NRAO and the work that we do. It's very small, but to us, of course, very significant. And so that's why we think it's important to share um, these observatories and the work that we do and the, st uh, the studies that we've done with all of you. And so we have three different telescopes that we operate, the uh, Very Large Array or VLA, the Very Long Baseline Array or the VLBA, and the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array or ALMA, which we share with other observatories as well. But the VLA is the one that we're going to be focusing on today. And so I'll pass it off to Summer real quick and she can um, show us an introduction video to the VLA. All right, coming up. One second, Faith. <laughs> yeah, no worries. It that's the thing. We have to switch back and forth and zoom to share video. So please bear with us when it sometimes takes a second. Okay. Go. We are almost there. Yeah, no worries. And these, there we go. <laughs> In our search for a perfect location for the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array, the plains of San Agustin in central New Mexico checked every box in a radio telescope site's needs. High, flat, dry, and rimmed with mountains to block man-made radio noise from the nearest cities. During the last ice age, this 45-mile long, 12-mile wide expanse was filled by an enormous lake. Now dry, it has seen thousands of years of human occupation, a hundred years of cattle drives, and nearly half a century of world-class astrophysics research. Awesome. So now we'll, let's go back to our slideshow here. So as the video mentioned, um, we are located on the plains of San Agustin in um, an ancient lake bed in New Mexico. We began construction in the 1970s and completed and dedicated the VLA in 1980. And so as indicated on this map, the state of New Mexico is located in uh, the southwest corner, kind of the southwest part of the USA and uh, within the state, the VLA is in, in terms of north and south, it's about central, but more on the western side of the state. So right around over here. And uh, um, so we, when we built uh, the VLA, like um, the video was saying, we had many possible candidates for where we could build it. And we ultimately decided on uh, the plains of San Augustine because it's what we call high and dry. So when we're building a telescope here on Earth, one issue that we're always going to run into is that the air or atmosphere of the Earth will bend or distort the light that's coming to us from space, making it a little bit uh, harder to see. So we want to build uh, telescopes or at least many large professional telescopes here on Earth. We try to build them in higher elevations if possible where the air is a little bit thinner so we can lessen that problem. And also, and there's a lot of moisture or humidity in the air, that's another thing that can cause the light to become distorted. So we try to build telescopes in dry locations with low humidity to minimize that problem. And um, as you can see, we have mountains in most directions from these plains. And so larger cities off in the distance like Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Las Cruces, and even many more outside of the state of New Mexico, 
have a lot of radio sources like Wi-Fi and cell phones, things that would interfere with our observations. So these mountains act like a very nice natural shielding that um, is able to at least keep a lot of that from interfering with our work too badly. And so the VLA consists of 27 antennas. We technically have 28, but we're using 27 at any given time. And uh, each of them are about 90 feet or 10 stories tall. And the dishes are 82, uh, 82 feet or 25 meters in diameter. And we're at a latitude of 34 degrees north. And so we're able to see about 82% of the objects in the sky, which is pretty good. That just means that the remaining 18% are objects that are too far south for us to be able to properly see. And so um, of these 28 uh, dishes, like I said, we have 27 at any given time. So typically the, the 28th will be over at our antenna barn here, and that'll be where we're doing maintenance on it. Um, and the dishes, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, are arranged in a Y shape. And we operate the, uh, the VLA from our on-site control building, as you can see in the image here. And we have operators whose job it is to be out at this control building and operate the VLA. And you'll get to uh, meet one of them in a little bit. And so here is the uh, Y shape of the VLA of the 27 operational antennas. And that consists of the north and west and east arms. And each arm is made up of uh, double sets of railroad tracks. For the west and east arms, those tracks extend out to 13 miles. And for the north arm, it goes up to 11 miles. And that's just because there's a ravine way up at the end of the north arm that would have been expensive to build a bridge over. So rather than doing that, we just shortened the north arm a little bit. And we have a total of 72 different antenna stations on these arms that are each fully equipped to be able to have an antenna on them. And so it would be great if we had uh, 72 antennas and can just put one on each of the stations. But as you can probably guess, these uh, very large antennas are quite expensive to build. So we built 28 because that's what we were able to build. That's what we could afford. So what we do instead is we move the 27 antennas that we have to these different stations, putting them closer together or further apart into uh, different configurations, which which allows us to zoom out or zoom in. And so we have uh, four main different configurations that we use. We were feeling quite creative the day that we named them. So we called them A, B, C, and D. And so uh, in the A configuration where the antennas are a long way away from each other, the um, if you were to draw a circle around the outer edges of those antennas, that circle would have a diameter of 22 miles or 36 kilometers. The B configuration, which is the one that we're in right now as of Wednesday, is uh, seven miles in diameter or 11 kilometers. Then you have the C configuration, which is two miles or three and a half kilometers in diameter. And then you have the D configuration where the antennas are darn close together. And that has a diameter of one kilometer or about 0.6 miles. And so when uh, we're in the A configuration where the antennas are a long way away from each other, we are the most uh, zoomed in. So we can see the finest details, the highest resolution of the objects that we're looking at. When we're in the D configuration and it's the most closely packed together, that's when we're the most zoomed out. So we can see much larger structures of objects in the sky. And you can see this is meant to show just what the difference is for how the antennas are arranged on the planes between the four different configurations. So this little white circle that you see here in the middle is that's the one that has a one kilometer or 0.6 mile diameter. This is how uh, large the B or the D configuration is. Then you have C configuration right here. This one right here is B configuration. And finally out of the edges all the way out here, that's the A configuration. And so this image here shows you just how big of a difference there is between if you look at the same object in different configurations. 
Um, so you might get the best idea of what an object looks like by looking at it with all four of them. So you can see with the D and C configurations, we can see the puffy clouds of this uh, quasar, this jet of high energy particles that are being shot off into space. With the A and B configurations, you don't see the puppy clouds anymore, but you see uh, the finer details of those jets. So that's why sometimes people will want to know why don't you just use the A configuration all the time because that's the biggest one. As you can see here, there are certain things that we can't see as well with the A configuration that we can see better with uh, D. And so what uh, many astronomers will want to do is ask to use all of the different configurations and take the data that they get from each one and combine them and then they can get the best um, idea of what's going on with their object. But it also just depends on what you want to look at. Some astronomers might only need to look at the big diffuse clouds and so maybe they only want the, the C or the D configuration or other astronomers might prefer the finer details that you'd see with A or B. So it tends to vary in that regard. And so what we normally move the antennas between the different configurations every four months, and we go um, from smallest to largest, so backwards in alphabetical order, D to C to B to A, and then back down to D. Uh, ever since September 2017, we've been doing a project called the VLA Sky Survey, or VLAS. And so VLAS involves um, scanning and mapping the entire portion of the sky that the VLA can see a total of three times over the course of about eight years. So this project is going to be complete in 2025 and observing uh, millions of different objects in the sky. And VLAS uses the B configuration, so the one that we're currently in, and also a hybrid configuration where uh, the north arm is in that A configuration and then the west and east arms are in B, so we call that the B and A configuration. And so, um, and so we typically will, between going from B to A, we'll just go into that hybrid for a couple of weeks. And we want to have enough time to use uh, the B configuration to do VLAS observations, but also other projects from various astronomers and scientists as well. And so we typically extend, instead of being in each configuration for four months, right now we've been using the B configuration for around five or so months each time. Then we go into the hybrid configuration for around two to three weeks. And we've been shortening the A, C, and D configurations to around uh, three months apiece. And when we're in that hybrid configuration for those two or three weeks, we use that solely for VLAS observation. So that's basically a two to three week period entirely devoted to VLAS. And this is also a totally public project. So the data from VLAS, once it's been uh, properly compiled and put together is completely available to the public. And so we'll post uh, the website for VLAS in the chat for anyone who would like to learn more about it. And for moving these VLA antennas, we use our transporters to do that. And so these transporters were specifically made to be able to carry VLA antennas, which weigh 230 tons, which is 460,000 pounds. And so they slide underneath the antennas, pick them up, carry them down uh, the tracks and uh, put them down at the new station. And each of the 72 stations is fully equipped with all of the necessary electronics and uh, fiber optics that we need to run them. So we don't have to bring a bunch of cables along with us when we move the antennas, just put them down, plug them in and then get them up and running and soon they'll be able to observe again. And these transporters have to move pretty slowly because as you would probably guess, we don't wanna have them zooming down the tracks and have an antenna fall off. That would be really, really bad. So they have a maximum speed of only five miles per hour, which is eight kilometers per hour. And when they're carrying an antenna, they only go about one or two miles per hour, which is about one and a half to three kilometers per hour, again, for safety purposes. And, 
Um, also for safety purposes, we don't move antennas if the wind speeds are too high. So if they're at 20 miles per hour or 32 kilometers per hour or higher, again, we don't want to risk the wind potentially blowing them over. So we just don't move antennas during that time. And so typically we plan for about two weeks to um, move based on how fast our transporters can move and the staff that we have to be able to um, move the antennas into the different configurations, but it doesn't always take that long. It kind of depends on which uh, configurations we're moving to. So sometimes if it's really windy and we're going from A all the way back down to D when we have to do a lot of moving, it might take more like three weeks. That's happened before. And then other times um, the conditions are good for moving and we're able to get it done really quickly. So we can do it in a week or less. We actually just moved this week from the C into the B configurations. And, um, and, and we, it only took us three work days. So from Monday through Wednesday, and we finished putting all of the antennas into their new locations by Wednesday. So we're very thankful for our track crew who's in charge of doing this for us because uh, they do an excellent job. And um, we, when it comes to moving antennas, we can still observe even as we're moving them. And we have what we call the three antenna rule, where as many of the three, as three of the operational 27 antennas may not be in use at any given time, but as long as we have 24 of them up and running, we don't have to bring our uh, mechanics out to the VLA site after hours to do any fix ups on the antennas. So if there are, are up to three of them that are having a bad day and not working. As long as uh, we ha can have at least 24 up and running, then we uh, it's not a huge concern and we can save fixing up the issues for the next uh, work day. And so now I'm gonna pass it off to Summer and she'll show you a neat video that talks and shows more about our transporters and how they work. Thanks, Faye. schedule. The two transporters are used to pick up some of the antennas and move them to different pads. One of our two transporters, it's a unique machine. It uh, comprises four trucks. Sorry about that. I'll explain in a moment how we actually turn corners with this. The basic idea of this, of this machine is pretty straightforward. You see the flat deck on there. The uh, transporter moves down the rails, slides underneath the antenna, uh, the antenna is then unbolted from the uh, three concrete piers on which it normally sits. The transporter is raised up on hydraulic jacks, lifting the antenna up about six inches, enough to clear the bolts, and the transporter then backs up and takes the antenna to the main line. Now the way the antenna transporter turns a corner is quite unusual for a rail vehicle. The engineers invented this right-angled turning system, uh, which uh, works in the following way. The transporter moves over the main line, and this is the main line heading down, uh, say, towards the center of the array. It's a double track. The transporter uh, trucks are each over the four intersections of the two uh, double tracks. A hydraulic jack lifts up one side of the transporter, three or four inches, just enough to clear the flanges of the, six, of the 12 wheels on one side. The two trucks of six wheels each on that one side are then rotated by 90 degrees and put back down again. The other side uh, of the transporter is then raised two or three inches. The other two trucks are rotated 90 degrees uh, and the whole assembly uh, rolls off in a 90 degree uh, different direction. Okay, go back to you, Faith. Great, thanks, Summer. Uh, here we go. And so now another thing that you can see when you get close to the um, antennas, or in this case, are able to see images of them, you can see the receivers. And so the VLA antennas have a total of uh, 10 receivers. And so the eight main ones are kept uh, near the center here. And then we have two additional receivers located in the subreflector up here. 
And so the VLA mainly observes at frequencies between one to 50 gigahertz. And, uh, and to translate that into wavelengths, one gigahertz is uh, 30 centimeters in wavelengths and 50 gigahertz is six millimeters. Although it can go higher or lower than that for certain observations, those are just the main ones that we use. And uh, the main one to 50 gigahertz range is divided into these eight receivers, each of which is used for observing uh, different sets of frequencies within that, uh, within that range. So one of them might be like one to two gigahertz would be for one of the receivers, et cetera, so on between the different ones. And so we call those frequency bands. And so when astronomers request to use the VLA, they specify which band or multiple bands they want to use. And uh, this asymmetric subreflector at the top of the dish will uh, rotate to ensure that the light uh, the dishes receive is sent to the proper receiver. So that bounces off the dish up to the subreflector and the subreflector is turned to point a specific direction so that it sends the light into the proper receiver that we're using. And uh, the receivers must be kept very, very cold or else they'll be able to detect their own body heat, so to speak, which would interfere with the uh, signals that we're trying to detect from space. And so at the bottom of the receivers in the vertex rooms, which are um, lower down in the antennas, so kind of like about in here-ish, in those vertex rooms, we have uh, liquid helium to keep them cryogenically cooled to 15 Kelvin, which is just 15 degrees above absolute zero. And so now I'll pass it to Summer again. We also have a, a video that talks a little bit more about the receivers and how they work. Yes, okay, Faith. So this video will show you the inside of the antenna, which is what no one can do right now, since we can't even go to the site, but in general, the public is usually not even allowed to go there. So this is a sort of insider's view. Behind us. Oh. I've done that so many times. It's like For all, the radiation comes in from the direction the antenna is pointing, strikes the surface. Uh, this Summer, we don't see the... The comical shape. Oh, so sorry about that. Let me try one more time. Yeah, no worries. The it's a good fun. <laughs> All right, here we go. One thing more that needs to be done for safety. And up we go. I've done that so many times, it's second nature. So this is a 25 meter paraboloid, and the paraboloid works the same way for all. The radiation comes in from the direction the antenna is pointing, strikes the surface. In this case, it runs up to that subreflector, that conical shaped uh, asymmetric subreflector. And from there, the radiation is, is down in a cone to go in one of the eight feeds. We change our frequency by rotating the subreflector. So these feeds are not on the optical axis of the antenna, but they're arranged around a ring called the feed ring. And we can illuminate any one of them at a time. So that's the reason why we normally can observe only in one wave band or one receiver band at a time. So the eight horns that you can see there, you can see they are all different sizes. The larger the size, the longer the wavelength. So the big one, is what we call L-band, one to two gigahertz. That's 30 to 15 centimeters radiation, which goes into that horn by appropriate rotation of that subreflector. If we're interested in two to four gigahertz radiation, then the subreflector is rotated by 180 degrees and the radiation goes down that second largest feed horn called S-band. And so on and so forth with the other six receiver bands by appropriate rotation of the subreflector the radiation from the direction we're interested in will go down through the, through the horn and into the receivers. Each of these horns is covered with this white window material. This is for weather purposes. We don't, it's not necessary for the function of the horn. This is to keep rain and snow and dew, bird droppings and everything else out of these horns. There's a little bit of loss associated with that, uh, but that's just something you have to, you have to accept. 
The funny inverted shape objects that are above the smaller horns are all heat lamps. We don't want dew or frost forming on the surfaces, especially at the higher frequencies or the shorter wavelengths. So when the dew point and the temperature are close together and sufficiently low for, for us to determine that dew is forming, the computer recognizes these combinations of conditions, turns on these heat lamps, which warms up the surface and prevents frost and dew from, from uh, condensing on top of these weather windows. Okay, back to you, Faith. Thanks, Summer. All right, so let's come back here. So we've been talking, or I've mentioned a lot about astronomers who use the VLA. So who can use it? And actually anybody from any country is able to use the VLA, even you in the audience there. It doesn't cost money to use. And, um, and that's true regardless of uh, where you live, which country you're from. We have what we call an open skies policy where we give uh, VLA observing time to the projects that have the most uh, scientific merit. And so you just have to write a proposal explaining what you want to look at, which configurations and frequency bands you want to use, and the merit, so why it would benefit the scientific community for you to do these observations. And of course, we're not able to give time to everybody, because for every hour of um, observing time, we get about four hours worth of proposals and requests, so we do have to pick and choose. And typically how we handle that is we have a we have a panel of astronomers who have used the VLA before for many institutions and they will grade these proposals so higher or lower grades to prioritize them. So a high priority means that you're pretty much guaranteed to get to uh, have telescope time the next time, so if you request say the. A configuration, then the next time we're in the A configuration, you're pretty much guaranteed to get time regard, um, unless something catastrophic happens with the array. And so if you get a middle level grade, then that means that you might get to observe if there's still time left in your chosen configuration at the end and we've gotten through all of the higher priority proposals. And if you get a lower grade, that means that you probably won't be able to observe this time, but you can al always uh, change your proposal, edit it and resubmit it again in the future. And maybe you'll be given time at the next time we're in that configuration. And it also can depend on what's happening in the sky right now. Different configurations may be more or less in demand at certain times, depending on um, whether certain objects are up during the daytime or during the nighttime, or if there are other major events happening. So it can just depend on the circumstances too. And so let's say that you wrote a proposal and you were granted observing time. And so at that point, you work with our data analysts to use our computer programming and write a code or script for the antennas during your observations. And so once your script is finished, and so you work with our data analysts to do that just to make sure that the code, the script will work properly, that it won't malfunction when it's talking to the antennas. But once you've gotten the script uh, written up properly, then it's sent to our operators and they put it in the queue or the collection of all the different scripts we have. And when it's time for your observation to begin, it uh, pops up on your script will pop up on the screen and we'll talk to the antennas and they'll turn and point at your object. And so the data travels uh, from the antennas to the correlator or the supercomputer that processes it. And another important thing that the supercomputer does here is that each of these different antennas will individually be getting data from pointing at the object and the correlator will multiply all of this data together and that's how that's how it acts that all of these smaller antennas are creating one big larger dish one telescope and so uh, once it's once the correlator has finished this process and combined all of the data from all of these different antennas it will inform the operator and the operator sends an email to everyone on uh, on the project, on the proposal, with a URL or a link that you can click on, and that's where you go to download your data. 
And once you receive the data, it's proprietary, which means private to you and those on the proposal with you for one year. And so that's a great time to make images with the data, such as the ones that you see here, uh, write papers and plan for further research. And of course, you can still continue to do those things after a year. But one year after uh, your data, after your observation has been complete and the data has been processed, it goes into our public archives where anyone can access it. So let's say I had written a proposal to use the VLA and it got a very low grade and I didn't get the opportunity to do so, I could instead go to these public archives to see if a somewhat similar project was done and use that data instead. Or I might just be able to entirely skip the proposal process altogether if I wanted to look at radio data of a certain object and there's already been a project done for that before, I could just go straight to those public archives to get the data without even needing to bother writing a proposal and use that instead. And so when talking about uh, the VLA and we've of course, it's been around for quite a while now. So this is our 40 year anniversary. And so when we built it in 1980, it was a state of the art telescope. But as you all know, as technology continues to get better over time, and especially over the course of now 40 years, uh, if something that you built at a certain time will fall behind technologically if you don't keep it up to date. So by the time we reached the 1990s, the VLA was beginning to fall behind like that itself. So once we got to late 2001, we started a project to upgrade the VLA. We gutted all of the old technology inside the antennas and we replaced it with uh, newer technology. We replaced uh, that correlator supercomputer that receives the data with a more powerful version. And we uh, we used to have an analog system of, take, of carrying the data from the antennas to the computer, but we went digital. And so uh, we upgraded to fiber optics. And that took us a little over 10 years to complete. So we fully completed these upgrades in 2012. And it's now a 10 times more powerful telescope and is once again, cutting edge. We slightly renamed it officially as the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array. So if you ever see it referred to as the JVLA or sometimes the EVLA for Expanded Very Large Array, it's just referring to specifically this new and improved version of the telescope. And um, we're already starting to think about what we want uh, it to look like next when the current version becomes outdated. And so our hope for that is the next generation or NGVLA, which would consist of antennas that are smaller than our current ones. So the diameters would be about 59 feet or 18 meters, but we'll have over 200 of them spread out throughout New Mexico and into neighboring states to create an even more powerful telescope. And and so these diagrams here, what you see here is what the very center of the array would look like. And then as you zoom out a little bit more, the antennas would seem to make this pinwheel shape. And then you zoom out even more and you can see that we would even have some antennas going into Texas, into Arizona, and even into Mexico. And so far we've received funding to continue researching and planning for the NGVLA. And we've also gotten money to build a prototype NGVLA antenna. So that's really exciting. And this would take about a decade to build. So if we can get the funding to build the whole thing, our current hope is that we would start building in the mid to late twenties and complete the project by the mid to late thirties. All right, so now I'm going to bring our first guest speaker on to talk with us a little bit, one of our very own VLA operators, Sylvia Kowalski. So I will stop sharing my screen and uh, Sylvia, please feel free to join us. Hi, Bailey. Oh. <laughs> Hello, good morning or evening, wherever you are in the world. To me, it's morning. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for having me, Faith. It's always awesome to do these tours. <laughs> yes, thanks for coming today. So first things first, so why don't you tell us about 
uh, the different kinds of things. Being an operator, you have a lot of different stuff to do, right? So what kind of stuff does that yes. entail? Yes, great question. So <laughs> we like to say we wear many, many, many hats as operators. Um, part of that has to do with the fact that the very large array can collect radio light 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year, every year of the millennium. <laughs> So, so depending on what type of shift you're working, the work that you're doing can be kind of different. So um, that does mean that we work, sometimes we work daytime shifts, sometimes we work evening shifts, sometimes we work during the midnight or swing shift, um, I mean midnight or graveyard shift. Um, if we're working a daytime shift, those shifts typically are more about our job as a site manager. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a really huge instrument and it really does take a village worth of people to keep it up and running and maintained and, and running smoothly. And when you have so many people working on so many different things, in addition, climbing around and working on antennas, you really need to have one person that at all times knows where everyone is and what they're doing um, for logistical reasons so that we can communicate with the rest of the observatory what is happening and what kind of work is occurring, um, but also for, you know, emergency situations, we need to know where people are at, at any one given time. So, so yeah, so part of our job is very site management, technical communication, leadership type job. Um, but we could also, you know, in the same week, maybe we're working a midnight shift where there's the only other people on the site with us are the security guards. Um, and we're doing a lot of science. So we're, we're um, collecting data for the astronomers that were awarded proposals. Um, if that's the type of job we're doing, um, it's a lot of, we, we like to say we're like junior systems engineers. We have to be able to understand the entire instrument because we are looking at the data that's flowing out of the instrument. And if something is goofy, we are the last line of defense. So we have to be able to figure out, okay, this data is weird. Why is it weird? Where is it coming from? And then try and use, um, you know, this plethora of software tools that we have to try and remedy that issue. Um, so site management, a lot of troubleshooting. Um, and then, of course, kind of like I, I alluded to earlier, we're, we're a really important part of emergency response. Um, so it's also a lot of leadership in potentially high stress um, situations. Yeah, right. I hope that answered your question. I kind of just. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. So lots of different awesome. stuff to do. And so yes, you mentioned yes. um, the, the different shifts, too. So how often do you have to have people out on site? How often are yes. each of the operators on site? Great question. So we do, um, we only have one operator at a time in the control room. Um, we actually did that even before the COVID pandemic. Um, so it was obviously really easy to transition into a, a time where we didn't want to have multiple people in the same room. Um, so we work, uh, every operator works four 10 hour shifts a week. Um, unfortunately, because we don't have a huge team of operators, we have seven operators that keep the VLA operated all the time, except for Thanksgiving and Christmas, which I am very proud of. We are, we are small, but mighty. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah. So sometimes again, we, we, there isn't really a consistency to the type of shifts we're working. We try to, you know, if you work, if you're working a couple day shifts, we try and clump them together, but you could be working day shifts or evening shifts or midnight shifts in one given week. Um, we do have one operator, Sam, we love Sam who works. He loves midnight shifts and the rest of us are like, not our favorite. So he works mostly midnight shifts, which are great. We don't have to do as many of those. Um, but yeah, four tens, which is awesome. We get three day weekends. Um, yeah. And we all live in Socorro, but we do drive out to the VLA at the start of and the end of our shift, which is about an hour drive. So that's a part of our work day, which is actually really nice to be paid for the, the commute um, to get out there. Yeah, definitely. That's nice that uh, they're able to do that because, yeah, it is that um, is true for really any of our staff. We do have a, a village between Socorro and the site. So. 
some people are only a half hour way away, but still we, yeah, we don't have anyone living out at the VLA. So we all have to drive. And so for the operators, that's part of your daily shift. So, <laughs> so um, what kinds of, uh, of eventful stuff, like when there's something happening at the site or when oh. <laughs> there's something uh, that blows up or whatever, what kind of stuff yes. like that do you have to deal with? <laughs> yes. So I would say the things that wreak the most havoc are electrical related. Um, you know, like in your house, if there's, you know, a, a small power glitch and maybe your alarm clock turns off and then turns back on or the lights flicker. Um, when that happens at the VLA, it is that times like 5 million. <laughs> because <laughs> these, these antennas are really complex and they have so many different modules within them and they require um, a lot of synchronizing to be able to use, you know, all of these individual telescopes to synthesize a much bigger one and so even just one small dip in power really wreaks havoc so those are definitely probably the most stressful because it requires a a ton of checking in on each antenna and resetting a bunch of modules and making sure all the temperatures have returned um, ensuring that our correlator is still nice and cool because that's a there's a ton of computing power and heat that occurs in the supercomputer room um, Thankfully, we have backup systems and backup systems and backups for our backups for everything from cooling to power. So, so we, we have, you know, a really stable system in place if things do fail, but even little things like, like power glitches are really wild. Um, and then things that are more routine, you know, maybe at the beginning of a, of a science observation, that script that you were talking about will send commands to each antenna. And oftentimes they do exactly what they need to do, but sometimes they just need a little kick to get them to go to wherever they need to go. So sometimes we're just coaxing antennas to do what we want them to do. Sometimes we're, you know, it's, it's a little more intense, but yeah, I would say those are probably the most <laughs> power things are the most stressful. And of course, anytime there's an emergency related to um, a human or an uh, instrument. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And it sounds like, and that's the thing, I guess, when you've got a lot of stuff going out there at any given going on at any given time, it would be easy for one thing or another to blow up. So on the <laughs> note of um, antennas, so operators often mention that antennas have their own personalities to them. So do you have um, favorites? Are there any that are particularly problem children or? Yes. So it's so funny when, when I was training, people told that to me and I was like, that's funny. They're just being like funny and cute. They don't actually have personalities, but they super do. Like <laughs> for example, um, antenna 13, when all the antennas are pointed one direction in the sky and then we're like, okay, now we're going to slew, we're going to move and we're going to look at this source in the sky. Antenna 13 is always the first on source. She like has her stuff together. <laughs> Whereas antenna 12 is usually the last one. <laughs> so sometimes you feel like antenna 13, sometimes you feel like antenna 12. It's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, just little like goofy, goofy little minor things that it, it, it is really funny. They're all very much unique, but we love them the same. Our 28 awesome. steel children. <laughs> Hi, Summer. Um, I hate to jump in the middle of this. Oh, but, yeah, uh, good. yeah, it's time to pass it over to yeah, Summer. I have no worries. Forever. So <laughs> um, that's okay, because I just want to let everybody know we're going to bring Sylvia back for the Q&A at the end after we have the next couple conversations with our guest experts. So you will definitely have a chance to ask her your questions. Um, so thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Faith, for the awesome VLA foundation that you've just laid. Thank and you. I, Faith, can you share the slides again? And I'll just um, ask you when to advance them. Absolutely. All Thank right. You. So, perfect. Yeah. So, before we bring on our guest speakers, I just wanted to give a tiny overview of some of the things that we will be talking about in depth, but some other NASA collaborations that the VLA has participated in. And I've just ordered them uh, chronologically. So the very first one, which we will talk about in depth um, shortly, is 
in from 1989 when uh, NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft did a flyby of Neptune. So both Voyager spacecraft were launched in the late 70s um, and they were doing a tour of the outer solar system the first time we'd ever done something like this. And if you know your uh, planetary order, Neptune is very far out there. And NASA was very concerned that their signal back from the Voyager spacecraft was going to be too faint for their deep space antennas to pick up. So they actually approached NRAO about helping and by using the VLA to receive this signal. And it turns out that they actually had to do some tweaking of the VLA. So when we bring Miller Goss on in just a couple of minutes, he will tell you all about that. Faith, if you could advance to the next slide. The next thing in um, the early 90s that the VLA participated with NASA in was radar mapping of the planet Mercury. So in this case, again, the VLA was receiving a signal, but it was not actually receiving radio waves being emitted by Mercury or by a solar system body. It was receiving bounced radar signals. So NASA's Goldstone antenna, which is pictured here, is part of the Deep Space Network, but is also a part of their solar system radar um, group. So radar mapping um, happens when they send out a radar signal to a surface and receive the bounced signal back and the different ways and timing of the bounced back signal can tell them about the surface of the object. So next slide, please. For Mercury, what they did in 1991, NASA's Goldstone antenna sent the radar signal out and the VLA received it um, because it was much fainter by the time it had gone all the way to Mercury and bounced back. And the image of the left of the left image is the received signal that they got in August of 1991. And you can see that there are bright spots um, and they are labeled at the North and the South Pole. And again, in 1994, they did this as well. And essentially that brightness, the brightness is showing the more signal that they got back. And they wouldn't normally expect to have bright signals coming from the poles because if you think about a round object and you're sending a signal, um, when you get towards the edge, you think maybe it's just gonna bounce and then continue off, um, kind of like when you skip a stone on the surface of a lake. But because of the actual composition of that area, the, it being ice, the scattering of that signal scattered a bunch of it back. So the brighter regions were completely unexpected. Um, but especially because Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. So your instinct would say, oh, it's way too hot and you could never have ice there. But it actually is just the majority of the planet uh, around the equators that gets that intense heat. There are actually pockets in the North and Southern poles where the surface can stay hidden from the sun and temperatures can get as low as 100, minus 170 degrees C. So when this was first um, announced at a planetary science conference in 1991, um, people got really, really excited. Astronomers were very, very excited. Okay, next slide. Um, right after this, in the mid nineties, the NASA's Galileo probe, NASA had a Galileo orbiter that was sent to Jupiter. It was launched in 1989, arrived in Jupiter in 1995, but part of that spacecraft was a tiny probe that uh, detached from the orbiter and plummeted through the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. And the goal of that probe was for, to survive as long as possible and to measure uh, wind speed, temperature, pressure, et cetera. And there was concern again from NASA that maybe getting the signal back from the probe itself was gonna be an issue. So the probe only had a 25 watt radio transmitter and what they decided to do was they wanted to send the signal from the probe instead of directly back to earth, send it to the orbiter, and then the orbiter would relay it. And they were potentially gonna use just accelerometers on the spacecraft to capture this motion due to high winds. But a couple of uh, NASA engineers did some calculations and realized that that signal from the probe, which was effectively 100,000 times weaker than the faintest signal like your car FM radio could pick up. 
so really, really faint, but the VLA could detect it. And so they decided to try and capture this signal with the VLA because that enabled them to have the VLA observing Jupiter as the probe is going down and the probe is sending its data to the orbiter in real time, not back to Earth, but the VLA could sort of over, not over here because it's not sound, but essentially the VLA could capture that tiny little signal, even though it's buried in the noise. And then the VLA could also observe the signal that the orbiter transmitted back. And so essentially it's getting one signal that's redshifted and one signal that was um, as it was measured and the site itself. And so essentially it could calculate the lengthening or shortening of the wavelengths of the transmitted probe so that you would get the wind speeds as it's being buffeted, as it's plummeting into Jupiter. Essentially, the probe lasted about an hour. Um, one more slide, Faith, you can see some of the results here. Yeah, so it had a parachute, slowed it down a little bit. Um, it lasted 61.4 minutes, and it endured about 228 Gs, G-forces a minute. Um, and the wind speeds that they expected to detect were roughly 220 miles per hour, 350 kilometers per hour, but they were actually over 100 miles per hour greater than that. So even at the sort of shallow distance that the probe got down, the winds were up to 330 miles per hour or 530 kilometers per hour. And uh, next slide. The second thing that we're going to talk about in more detail today um, is the Parker Solar Probe. So this is a NASA mission to study the sun's outer atmosphere, and it has been, um, I forget when it launched, but it has orbited the sun. Um, it's orbiting just the sun, so it's not coming all the way out to the Earth's orbit, but it has gone um, closest approach at least five or six times to date. And what happens is we've been using the VLA to observe that same area that the probe is flying through the sun's atmosphere as the probe is actually doing it. So in essence, we're getting the measurements of the probe actually flying through the atmosphere and we're getting the measurements of the VLA observing the atmosphere that from a distance that the probe is going through. And so our guest today, um, Jason, will be telling us more about what they're learning from that. And last slide. And lastly, just looking forward. So this is just on the edge of the horizon because this was only recently um, announced in the past year and it's still much in the planning stages. Um, we don't really have that many details yet, but there's a NASA mission called the Dark Ages Polarimetry Pathfinder, DAPR. Everyone loves an acronym. And this mission will eventually be a lunar, an observatory um, spacecraft uh, on the far side of the moon, essentially the most radio quiet zone you can have because here on earth, all of our devices are now giving off radio signals, making the skies super noisy for telescopes like the VLA, which is one of the many reasons that we put it out in the plains of St. Augustine and we have you turn off everything when you arrive at the site. Um, but it's gonna be trying to observe signals, radio signals from um, molecular hydrogen. So hydrogen clouds, and um, space are what eventually condense to form stars. And that kind of tells us a lot about the star formation history of the universe and things like that. So DAPR essentially is piggybacking on NASA's Artemis plan, um, Artemis program, sorry, which is to take um, uh, humans back to the moon. And so because it doesn't have to be its own mission launching from earth, that can be a lot of cost savings. It's sort of being taken on a ride and delivered to the moon. Um, and it's our central development laboratory, which is an arm of NRAO that is based near our headquarters in Charlottesville, Virginia, that will be building a prototype um, receiver for this mission. Um, so they're going to spend the next coming years doing a design and prototyping, um, and we'll see where it goes from there. So lots of cool NASA stuff, but I think it'll be really fun to dive into some stories about the um, the Voyager encounter and the current stuff that we are doing with the Parker Solar Probe. So let's start with Miller. Miller, could you turn your camera on? And Faith, if you could stop screen sharing, that would be perfect. There you are. Hi, Miller. 
Hello, greetings. And Miller, um, you are a professor emeritus here at NRAO and former director of the VLA from 1988 to 2002, correct? Yes. In addition to just being in radio astronomy for decades on end. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> almost uh, five or six decades, I'm, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, yeah, if you want to press um, presentation mode on your slides. Yes, I will. No problem. Just a minute. That's okay. Uh, if you go to slideshow. Yeah, I went to slideshow. Uh, sorry, I can't. You're almost there. Is that it there? That's review. The next one to the left is slideshow. Oh, no, it, that's a different menu. Sorry. Pat, quit. Try resume slideshow. Resume slideshow. Yes. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Nope, that's okay. Uh, we got it. Okay. We got there. So, it's great to talk to all of you today. And thank you, Summer and Faith and Sylvia, for doing such a great job. Let me just give it a little bit of background. Uh, the flyby in 1989, as Summer has already mentioned, it was very important for NASA. They had figured out they needed to detect these weak television signals coming from the most distant planet in the solar system. Uh, and you appreciate that we're calling now Neptune is the most distant planet, not Pluto. Pluto has been demoted and that's very controversial. And we could spend probably hours discussing about the pros and cons of, of what's happened to Pluto. But of course we know a lot more about Pluto now because of the, uh, this, uh, the successful uh, satellite imaging of Pluto that's occurred in the meantime. But 1989, NASA saw that they had never anticipated that they were going to have to detect these weak television signals from Neptune. And they figured out, let's take another big radio telescope that's equivalent to a 110 meter telescope. That's the VLA. If you add up all the collecting area, you get one single dish. It's about 110 meters. This is compared to 64 meter for the Goldstone antenna at the time. Faith. Uh, Summer has shown a picture of that at the moment. It's been upgraded to a 70 meter antenna. So you could essentially double the signal noise, the right that you could get TV signals. And of course, getting a TV signal from uh, uh, Neptune was quite a challenge. The one way travel time, the speed of light was a little over four hours. So if you wanted to tell the satellite to do something, you sent a signal you waited four hours, the signal got to the satellite, it turned the switch on or off, and then you had to wait another four hours to see, see if it worked. So, so it was very important for planetary science, of course, to uh, support this mission from NRAO's point of view, but it's also, as, as I'll point out, it was also very important for the VLA because NASA was able to support a great deal of enhancement of our infrastructure and gave us a new frequency that became extremely important. Let's talk quickly about uh, Neptune. It's the ne only naked eye planet discovered in 1846. And if you wanna read a fascinating story about the controversies of, of the discovery of, of uh, an object in astronomy, read the story of the discovery of in 1846, it was a French group, a German group, and there's even a possibility that Galileo himself had seen Neptune in the 17th century. And that is a fascinating a new development in the history of science. The flyby was on the nighttime of the 25th of August, 1989. The problem was, this was during the monsoon month. Sylvia has indicated already the problems with weather and power. I'll come back to that. Voyager 2, was launched first in 1977. Two, two weeks later, maybe 16 days later, Voyager 1 was launched. You see, it's out of order. Voyager 1 went faster and only visited uh, Saturn and, and Jupiter. Voyager 2 was scheduled then to visit Uranus and uh, Neptune. 
And you can see it was very important to do it at this particular epoch because all the, these major planets were somewhat aligned in the solar system. You can see if, you, if you'd waited a, another 50 years, they'd be out of sync. So this was a unique opportunity. So they hit Jupiter first, a couple of hour, years later, Saturn, a few more years, Uranus, 86, 89, you see, uh, what is that? Uh, after the uh, launch of uh, uh, 1977 is uh, 12 years later. And if you want to read what's happened, look online. There are some fantastic, beautiful images on the NASA website, websites of uh, Triton, one of the, more, the most interesting uh, uh, moons in the solar system. It's about the same size as our moon, but it rotates counter direction to its orbital motion. It's the only object in the solar system that we know about. Tons of discoveries were made. Uh, rings were dis discovered, six new satellites. There are now 14. Uh, and, the whole, and lots of details of Triton in the nitrogen atmosphere we're seeing. Okay, now why the VLA? I've already mentioned this. You don't double the rate of imaging, but the, uh, because of using the VLA, but there were other things that had to happen. It was the monsoon season. Lightning strikes the VLA frequently. And the year before, the year before 1988, I had just become director. A lot of the hard work had been done already by people like Ron Eakers, whom some of you met on a previous uh, uh, Saturday uh, a month ago, uh, Peter Napier. But a lot of the hard work was done by a fantastic engineer, Bill Brundage who had come from Ohio State as a young man and worked at Green Bank and came to Socorro and was a project manager for the, uh, the Voyager flyby project with NASA. We got struck by lightning in 1988, the building did. It was a catastrophe. Uh, telephones went out, fax machines, which we had in, in 1977, computers died, et cetera. NASA is an expert on lightning because of Kate Kennedy or Kate Canaveral. Yeah. And they sent some people and they built an incredible lightning protection system, the ultimate lightning rod system, of many different cables that were connecting that, that grounded the, the building. And we know it worked because the building did get struck by lightning at about that era and we survived. The other thing, the power integrity at the VLA was a big question. It's the monsoon season, we have electrical storms. The, uh, the electric company, has interruptions, sometimes failures of some hours. NASA didn't like this, and they provided us with a, a, a generating system that we used uh, during the flyby. And that system lasted until a couple of years ago when it had to be replaced. So this was our own electric generation. But the most important thing that NASA had to do was to increase the sensitivity at X-band, 3.6 centimeters or 8240 uh, 8,240 megahertz, very high frequency, similar to the frequencies that your uh, direct TV system works on, on the roof of many of your houses. So this increased the sensitivity, the system noise was decreased. Uh, as Faith has pointed out, we cool everything to 20 degrees Kelvin. It's not liquid helium, but it's uh, gaseous helium that's very cold. And we, we get this fantastic increase in sensitivity. And the good news was you see when the project was over, these receivers stayed with us. It produced a tremendous increase in the capabilities of the VLA science projects. And so many of us that, that observed uh, ob objects in this, not only in the solar system, but in the Milky Way and in uh, external galaxies profited by this, uh, this new receiver system that was contributed uh, by NASA. Also, it was very important with the connections of the people, many different people from uh, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, Pasadena, were interacting with us. We met them. In fact, one of the most prime benefits was we met Jim Ovalstead, who was a young scientist at JPL, who had, was a radio astronomer that we knew. We hired him, and later on, he became my successor as the uh, director of the VLA in 2002. And after that, he's had an illustrious career at the uh, National Science Foundation. 
So you see, this was a very important uh, side benefit. And there were many other cases that uh, spin off with electronics uh, groups, et cetera. Yeah, it was like parting gifts from NASA. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And then I got one more couple of couple. So what they do, I've already told about the lightning rods, power cables were replaced, new generator, new X-band receivers. It all worked. And J JPL uh, also, there are radio astronomers at JPL, and they also benefited with many different experiments and quite and a lot of the radar work that was done by uh, JPL and collaborators and Caltech scientists was also at that time. Let me just show you a final uh, takeaways. As, as anybody that's associated with NASA know, they specialize in elaborate mementos. <laughs> They're really good at it. And this is what, see, it's it's thanking us at NRAO for the Voyager 2 Neptune encounter. It gives all the dates of uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and tells the new signs. And we had lots of publicity. And in fact, within a year at, after 1989, we had an open day when I think we had visitors coming to the VLA with lots of folks from JPL came and talked about the science of Voyager to at uh, Neptune and also the, the technological developments. And we had a thousand or 1100 people at the VLA. It was an amazing event. Yeah. The final memento is on our wall at the VLA now showing some of the signals that we were seeing in real time. It occurred at about uh, in the middle of the night and you see the the time scale here to here is about 10 minutes. So here, the inbound ring plane crossing with a delay of four hours, of course. Spacecraft maneuver occurred here. They changed frequencies at this point. As I said, this is about uh, 10 minutes. It's just a, a real-time display and everybody got to sign it and I can find my terrible signature here. <laughs> But I'm also very pleased I can see Bill Brundage's signature next to me. So I'm, and you can imagine the director of the VLA was the most useless per person on the spot. If anything had broken, he, myself, would have not been able to fix anything, the software or the hardware. All I had done was talk to everybody. And I was just sitting around admiring the hard work that was done by all the engineers. And of course, you can imagine the generators were working and everybody was sitting there just bored over the generators, making sure the power uh, came through. So it worked. So this was a great achievement for planetary science, but it was a great achievement for the VLA because our infrastructure was improved. Uh, we got a new frequency, and if anybody's interested, I'll, I could tell you some story of why we call it X-Band, but that's a great story that I'll leave for anyone that's interested. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Miller. That was great. Um, if you turn your camera off and mic off, and I'll call you back for the Q&A in just a couple yes. minutes. Thanks. And Jason, you join us. Will do. Oh yeah, and Miller, if you just click stop screen sharing. Yes. Sorry, where is that? Somewhere at the top of your... Oh yeah, I got it. Yeah, thank you. You did it. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Jason. Hello. So you are a research scientist at the Naval Research Laboratory. So you are not at NRAO, but you get to be uh, involved with us and with the VLA through the Parker Solar Probe. Indeed. So what is your role on the Parker Solar Probe? Well, a funny story is I don't actually have a formal role on the Parker <laughs> Solar Probe mission itself. So there are plenty of people at the Naval Research Laboratory that are formally part of the mission. Uh, in particular, uh, the Naval Research Laboratory developed the WHISPER instrument, which I'll show some data from here in a moment. Um, and that's basically at, at NRL, Russell Howard is the PI for that instrument. So, you know, NRL is a big player in Parker Solar Probe. Right. And between my background with the VLA and radio remote sensing techniques and my unique station at NRL, uh, that's sort of what got me into uh, complementing Parker Solar Probe with the VLA. 
Very cool. And so, yeah, can you give us sort of a, a foundation of the Parker Solar Probe and its mission? Indeed. So hopefully, got a little thing up there on the screen. Yep, we see it. Perfect. So, all righty. So uh, just a smidgen background here. Since formally I'm a solar physicist or solar radio person. So since not everybody here is going to be going to be doing that sort of thing. Um, there we go, laser pointer. This is just a little background. So when you hear me say the solar corona or corona, I'm referring to the sort of outer atmosphere of the sun. So right in the middle of our solar system. And so this outer atmosphere is composed of a, a gas of electrons, protons, heavy ions. And most of the time we just refer to that as kind of the corona. And part of the reason for that is coming from the Latin word, basically meaning crown. So this is the thing that crowns the sun. And you can see here an image taken during a solar eclipse to show you the rich structure uh, just inside the corona of the sun. And when you hear me talk about solar wind here, I'm referring to kind of the continuous three-dimensional outflow from the corona into space. So Parker Solar Probe, or PSP. So ooh, wonderfully pictured right here on the right. So NASA, this is kind of NASA's current flagship solar mission. And it's, it's sort of mission motto is the first mission to touch the sun, to really get into where the action is. So solar, uh, solar Probe, or PSP, basically has a highly elliptical orbit. And every few orbits, it gets closer and closer and closer. And eventually, it's going to fly within 10 solar radius units, solar radii, which is about 4 million miles of the sun's surface or photosphere. And it carries on board three instruments for measuring basically the particles, magnetic field, electric field, electric currents, and one imager, WHISPER. So that's the NRL instrument. So the reason it wants to get so close to the sun is we have so many questions about you know, the solar wind itself. What heats the solar wind? Uh, how many or which mechanisms really accelerate the solar wind? So the solar wind in this region accelerates from subsonic to supersonic speeds. It accelerates from subalphanic to superalphanic speeds. Want to know more about alphane stuff? Talk about that in the quite <laughs> Q&A. And of course, this is where a lot of the high energy solar particles come from. So this is, you know, the VLA has been around for over 40 years uh, at this point. Uh, the concept for PSP has also been around for over 40 years and was finally launched in 2018. So this video here gives you kind of an idea. Try that again. There we go. So this shows you PSP's track through the corona or the solar wind. And basically it gives you an impression of how close PSP is gonna to get to the sun. So that thing in the middle, that's the sun. So this track shows you just how close PSP is gonna be in 2024 and 2025. And so what you're seeing in this video, all this motion, that's the solar wind pouring out from the sun and these massive eruptions you see these so-called coronal mass ejections, these are the primary drivers for things like space weather. So when we have power outages on Earth, when we have to tell the, the astronauts in space, oh, don't do a spacewalk today, right. uh, when we have aurora, those are the things that primarily drive those events. So and just to clarify for, for the viewers that um, because the sun is so intensely bright, that a lot of the central part has been masked out to see the, the details of that yes. outer atmosphere. Yes. And so the last comment I'll make about this video is you can kind of see 
these triangles, they kind of lay out the view of our camera, NRL's camera, the whisper imager as it flies around the sun. So like, like you just said, the sun is so bright, we can't just shine a camera at it for the same reasons, you know, you can't just walk outside and stare at the sun. You don't want to blind the camera. So the camera actually looks everywhere else but the sun here. So I'll move on to this one. So this is what the PSP is actually seeing as it flies through the solar wind. So you can see just sort of a rich, turn on that laser pointer again, you can see this rich structure, these streamers and microfilaments just erupting continuously from the sun. And this is these are not details you can see with any other imager we have in space or white light imagers on Earth. So, you know, this is this is really exciting stuff, the white light imaging coming out of NRL's thing. Beautiful. So I'm not going to go into the, the details of the data here, but what I want to point out, and this is kind of the, the complementarity of VLA and PSP, is in these plots, you're basically looking at how far you are from the sun. So PSP right now has been getting between about 20 solar radii to 35 solar radii. Those are our units we feel comfortable with <laughs> from the sun. Um, and the VLA, even in our first uh, set of experiments, has been going basically 4.6 out to 15 solar radii. So even in 2024 and 2025, when Parker Solar Probe is actually going to be sampling down to about nine solar radii, the VLA can get much, much closer to the sun with its remote sensing abilities. So the VLA basically observes the corona and provides insights to the plasma or the gases density, as well as the magnetic field in the corona itself. <laughs> while PSP measures kind of the corresponding solar wind. Right. And you can know. kind of connect the two and to tell the story of why yeah. we're seeing what we're seeing. And that's why we want to do these observations simultaneously so that you do have those two counterparts right. to see the whole picture. That's so neat. Very cool. Thank you, Jason. So Miller, if Miller and Sylvia and Faith would like to come back, and join us. Uh, we know that um, Sylvia has a uh, a limited time window because she is actually the next operator on duty for today's evening shift. Oh, you're muted. Look, she's ready to go. <laughs> I am fully prepared and ready to drive yeah. to the field. <laughs> yeah, so I'll I'll um I'll head out in just a, just a couple minutes. <clears throat> Yeah, fantastic. And Sylvia, I know that um, as an observer, as a operator, you often can look up the proposals of whatever the current observation is. So I know I've been there occasionally on days or weekends when we've bring brought tours into the operator room, and the Parker Solar Probe observations have been going. Yes, it is so cool. It, we um, obviously it's amazing to be a part of any astronomical research process because you realize that you're a part of helping humans understand the cosmos, which just makes my heart sing. Um, but it's extra, extra cool if you know that you're collaborating with another incredible organization to do science together. Um, it really makes me feel like, you know, wow, humans, we're so strong together. And it, it just really makes me feel excited. So yeah, it was awesome to hear all of that, Jason. <clears throat> Very cool. I know every time I'm out there, I'm um, not always knowing where the Parker Solar Probe is, but you can always tell at least when the VLA is looking at the sun, yes. because you get the shadow directly over the receiver yes. in the middle. And so yeah. you're like, that's the only time I'm like, oh, I know what they might be looking at. Right now. <laughs> Correct. And as someone who used to operate optical telescopes, it sometimes feels a little unsettling. You're like, wait a second. No, this is okay. This is okay. <laughs> so yeah <clears throat> fantastic so um everybody out there viewers you can um put in any of your questions that you have for anybody 
uh, who's <laughs> talked in the past hour and a half. I think we're gonna go a little bit long just because we wanna make sure that we get some of your questions answered. Um, but yeah, feel free to put them in the Q and A. Um, somebody is asking if PSP is gonna end up like Icarus. What will happen to it, Jason, at the end of its mission? Will they kind of fly too close to the sun? <laughs> well, that's the hope. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's been part of the, the, the big technological jump to do Parker Solar Probe is, you know, the, the thermal shield or the thermal protection system, the PPS for this satellite. So, you know, basically since uh, Eugene Parker first theorized that the solar wind should exist back in 1958, and then, you know, about eight years later, got the first continuous observations with Mariner 2, I think. Um, ever since then, physicists have been like, yeah, let's just throw something at the sun. That's going to be the <laughs> best thing ever. And... You know, we had to had to cool our jets for a couple decades, as it turns out. And you know, thanks to just amazing engineering design, uh, we now have the heat shields that allow us to, you know, get closer, 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 closer. So nominally, the mission extends to um, about the middle of 2025. But as long as the instruments keep operating, you know, I'm going to send it closer and closer in. Yeah. Uh, and as long as I guess, you know, we can get these assists from Venus, um, eventually, you know, it's almost like a heat death question. Is it going to burn <laughs> up? Is it going to happen? It's just going to slowly peter off. <laughs> Very yeah, cool. I wanted to get as close as possible until. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> We, we just had a question come in for um, Sylvia that I want to make sure she gets oh. before she has to leave. So a bit of a mom question from Jessica. What's the most memorable question you've been asked by someone, like a person attending a tour or at an event? Oh, oh that is such a good question. There really are fantastic questions. And every time we do a tour, someone asks something that I, that I never even think of. Um, I did get asked once what what is my favorite snack to eat during observing, which was really fun. And I'm currently on a um a seaweed snack kick. Um, they're nice because they're salty and they're crispy and they're they're delicious. But if I eat a ton of like really heavy food, I feel kind of lethargic. So lately I've been on a seaweed snack kick, and that was kind of a, a fun question. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was awesome. Um and with that, I I have to go operate the VLA. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great go day. Go Sylvia. Good go luck. Say go say hi to the antennas for us. Uh, Miller, I was actually going to ask you, I mean, um, in all of your time here uh, in Socorro, especially, do you have any um, really unique or memorable questions that people have kind of asked you, non-colleagues non have asked you about the VLA? Uh -huh. Or things you find especially interesting to share? Yes, I think you know. One is people are always interested. How in the world did you get here? Yeah. And that's a question we could all be asked. Of course, is because each one of us has a unique story, and it's it's often full of uh, the vagaries of life. What in the world happened? Who did we meet? Yeah. Uh, and in my case, when they they. A standard question is when they start talking to me, they realize in spite of my accent that I've spent a lot of my life in Australia and in the Netherlands. And especially occasionally at the VLA uh, uh, Sundial tour, about once a year, I would someone would ask me a question and I could tell they were Dutch by the way they were speaking English and I would answer in my incredibly pathetic North Carolina accented Dutch, and people will just flip over. They think, how in the world did, did you know all of this? And I said, well, after all, we did live for 10 or 12 years there. My kids speak perfect Dutch, and uh, I, I speak imperfect Dutch. But nevertheless, that was a, a fact that I, I was influenced by Dutch astronomy, and the same is the case in Australia. Uh, and why in the world did we end up in Australia uh, almost uh, – 
It was soon be uh, 60 years ago that my wife and I ended up in Australia. We went for two years and we stayed for eight or nine or something. One of our children is born there. And how is that possible? And it's then, of course, I can bore people for hours telling them about the history of, of Australian radio astronomy, which I'll not do today. No, but we can tell people that there is a book coming out soon by you on the father of Australian, Australian radio. radio astronomy. Yeah, and in, in fact, it's very relevant. It's, it's related to something that uh, Faith said. She said, we put all the signals together and make an image. That was invented in 1946 by this man and the, and the first woman radio astronomer, Ruby Payne Scott. They figured out how to, to take all the signals from all those telescopes and put them together with some of the fancy mathematics that some of you that have studied mathematics will know about Fourier analysis. And, and Fourier analysis was invented by these two people in 1946 based on their experience in World War II radar. And that's exactly what we do. And it's kind of hard to imagine what would Joe Posse or Ruby Payne Scott think about radio astronomy if they, we could show them the VLA. Yeah. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, and also just for um, everyone's sort of general knowledge background, the initial powerhouses of radio astronomy were sort of England, Australia, Netherlands. It, it really was the countries that, that, that worked on radar in World War II, United States, but especially Britain and Australia. So, and this is a point that I always make when I get talks about the history of radio astronomy. Those of us that are radio astronomers, we're the descendants of radio engineers from World War II. We're not descendants of astronomers. Right. Astronomy met radio astronomy in 1946-1950, and the optical astronomers thought this was nonsense, that these radio engineers from World War II radar were discovering things about the sun. And it related to what Jason said, is that Joe Pauzzi was the first person that did detailed radio observations of the solar corona in 1946, which was the largest sunspot maximum, maximum of the modern era. That is an incredible coincidence. Right. World, War, World War II ended, radio astronomer in, in Australia and Britain, they had to do something that was not related to defense and they started radio astronomy. And the sun went crazy in the solar maximum that was going to have a peak a couple of years later. And that's a piece of incredible coincidence. Right, because if the sun had been in a quiet phase, who knows yeah. what might have happened? Yeah, like the last sun, sunspot maximum, which was pathetic, I think. Isn't it correct, Jason? It was. Yeah, it was unimpressive. <laughs> whereas the 1946, 1947, 1948 solar maximum was incredible. There was a solar flare in 1947 detected in Australia that's said to have a peak flux density of 10 to the 13 Janskys. Now, that's not going to mean anything to anybody. But when you think about the fact that we now detect radio sources at the VLA at the Billy Jansky and even the Micro Jansky level, and you think about this, this was a solar flare that was 10 to the 13 times, what, 10 to the six, it's almost 10 to the 20 times uh, brighter. You see how important it was because they had very small pathetic radio telescopes in 1946 and they didn't need to be big because the sun was going crazy. <laughs> right. Got it. Sort of in perspective, compared to the 40s and the 50s, uh, recent solar maximum was like half you know, total number of sunspots, basically half, roughly. Yeah. So it's, it's a so fortunate coincidence. In 1947, the sunspots were so prominent in solar flares that aurora were being observed in Sydney, Australia, at latitude minus 33 degrees. Wow. Now, Jason, we showed a picture. We, the picture we showed of you earlier is you at the VLA. Yep. So did you get to spend some time out here? I did. I, of course, I actually grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. So, uh, my, my parents, who are actually, I think, in the audience there, the virtual audience, um, it was either shortly before or shortly after contact came out that they brought me down to the VLA on a road trip. 
and you know that that was pretty entertaining one of these things like i didn't know there are all these dishes just a couple hours south of where i was living um but yeah so that that picture that you included that was actually myself in graduate school at the university of iowa and i was fortunate enough that Iowa would send me down, you know, for actually two observations that I was a part of. And they let me just sort of bum around in Socorro for actually an entire semester once, uh, working on the CASA software that has popped up a couple times in the Q&A. So um, yeah, that, it's always fun to go down to Socorro. I, I actually, well, I went to New Mexico Tech uh, for my undergrad education and okay. master's in math. So I had a, I have a good time down there and I can't wait to get shipped out there again by NRL. <laughs> now I, should, in, I should say it's always been fun to, to meet Jason here. And here's another, if anybody's in the audience that knows it, Iowa, they'll be impressed to know that one of the most famous physicists of the 20th century, James Van Allen from Iowa City, Iowa. He spent a lot of World War II working on radar in Socorro. And fortunately, at a couple of times when I was on sabbatical at University of Iowa, well before Jason was there, I met James Van Allen and he told me what it was like to be in Socorro, New Mexico in 1943. It's a small town now, so it must have been a lot smaller. Yes. And New Mexico Tech was, had a handful of students in 1943 for obvious reasons. And James Van Allen told me a great deal of, of, uh, of his, the major role that he played in the development and the perfection of the proximity fuses, the second most important defensive weapon of World War II in Socorro, when he was working for the Carnegie Institution of Washington uh, in DC in 1942 as a young physicist. There's a lot of history here in this really small place in New Mexico. It's so wonderful. Um, now, Jason, you brought up contact. And just because we also happen to have Miller with us today, in addition to being there during the Voyager flyby, I know you were there, Miller, during the contact filming. Yes, I, in fact, it all started in a colloquium that I gave in 1991 in Ithaca, New York, and Carl Sagan was in the audience. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, gee, we're thinking about making a movie of the book that had already come out, Contact. Would you be interested? And I thought I would never hear from him again. <laughs> and sure enough, I did. And I organized the contract with uh, Warner Brothers. Uh, and and it, the tragedy was, as everyone knows, that Carl Sagan was extremely ill and and and, uh, and, and deceased during the, during the latter period of the, of the filming of the movie. But as we always say, the, the fact that the movie was made had an incredible impact on the number of visitors that we had. And so it was, uh, the, the story is, is a stretch of the imagination, of course. And some of us are not very impressed with some of the uh, scientific aspects of the book, but nevertheless, it had an incredible impact. And it's, it's been a big benefit to all of NRO. Just like Jason said, he was brought to the VLA. Yeah, people still come today because of that movie. Um, so I think I don't want to go over too much, but I really want to thank both Jason and Miller for joining us today. Thank you for your time on a Saturday and for sharing your excitement about radio astronomy with us. And I'm going to hand it back to Faith, who will just have a couple more things to wrap up. Thanks, Summer. All right, so let's uh, come back here. So if you've enjoyed uh, hearing about the VLA today and you'd like to learn more, we have an Explore page on our website that has a lot of great additional resources. So you can go to our VLA Mission Control, which shows 
on what the VLA is currently looking at and the two previous projects. It shows you the objects they're looking at and at least the um, basically what those projects are about. So you can see what the VLA is currently studying. And actually this mission control covers the VLA and another one of our telescopes that's down in Chile, the ALMA telescope. So you can see both of those. And we have a webcam that shows you what the antennas themselves are physically doing out at the site right now. And uh, the webcam is even, you're still even able to see the antennas a bit at night, even though we don't have, they're not lit up or anything, but the camera is good enough quality that you can still get some footage during the nighttime too. And those videos that Summer showed you a few times throughout the tour are part of our VLA Explorer series, which is a series of numerous different short videos that talk about the surrounding area and also can take you even more behind the scenes at the VLA site than what we are able to do when we are able to give tours. So show you what it would be like to climb an antenna, to go into our correlator room. So if you're interested in learning more, you should certainly check out the full VLA Explorer videos as well. And so now for our next event, we're transitioning to, since we're moving into a uh, new fiscal year, we're planning on doing virtual VLA tours once a quarter. So our next tour will be sometime between October and December. And you can check our website or our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram for more content. And we'll also put the, once we have a date set for the next virtual tour, that's where you can find it. But uh, thank you so much for uh, coming today. And thank you to our guest speakers, Miller, Jason, and Sylvia. We enjoyed having all of you here and we hope you had a good time at the tour today. And if you have time, once we end this webinar, you'll get a short survey that will pop up uh, in your browser. So if you're able to fill that out for us to give us any feedback you'd like to provide, that would be great. And make sure to look for the follow-up email that I mentioned at the beginning of the tour. And that's where you can get all of these links to our website. Plus again, another request for feedback if you don't get it now. So Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for coming here on your Saturday and hope you enjoy the rest of your day.